Brandon. So Tom and Mark, can we have you come up here? So we're going to go through uh, an examination by two of our world-class experts. Uh, Tom Noonan comes to us from Denver. He's part of the UC Health System uh, from the Stedman Hawkins Clinic and has been taking care of the Colorado Rockies uh, for quite some time. And then Mark Schickendance is from the Cleveland Clinic and Cleveland, Ohio takes care of the Cleveland Indians. And then we have our guests coming up and um, this, is our, this is our patient. So this is our baseball player. And uh, I'm gonna give you guys a mic. So I, I want you guys to, there, I'll help hold it for you, but let's, why don't you go ahead and stand up here. Yep. So, yep, please, if you go ahead and take your shirt off. So obviously for any examination of our athletes, we wanna be able to see directly down to the shoulder. And so we have to have them properly uh, disrobed so we can take a look at the entire shoulder from front to back. And so I'm gonna let you guys take it away. Tom and Mark, why don't you just start with uh, how you do your examination, what you're looking for, and what are some of the key points that you want the audience to recognize when you're doing an exam of a baseball player? Good morning, everybody. Is this working? Yeah, it's working. Um, thanks, Tony and Chris. Sure. I think first and foremost, when Tom and I uh, did our training together with, uh, with, uh, with Rich Hawkins, and he taught us that we we listen to the shoulder and we examine the knee. I think the, f the most important part of your physical examination of the shoulder is understanding a good history and taking a good history because that's going to focus then your exam on what you think is going on. There's so many different tests for, for the shoulder, lots of different physical exam findings. Um, you don't do everything on every player. So take a good history. That will help you first and foremost, I think, focus on what it is that's important. The other thing we always want to make sure is as, as Brandon pointed out, this is a full kinetic chain. So you know, even if somebody comes in simply complaining of their shoulder, they may have a tight internal rotation contracture of their hip. They may have something going on in their core. That's part of the history, and that can also be part of the physical. I don't necessarily examine everybody's hips um, uh, and core every time they come in to see me for a shoulder problem, but we certainly have a discussion about that. And certainly if they have a history of a hip problem or a core problem or another part of their lower extremity, that becomes part of our physical exam as well. Um, so those things, I think, just start with that, and, and, and you're off to a good uh, you're off to a good start. For me, um, I always have the guys, you know, standing in front of me. I think um, I, I always think about cervical as well. Uh, so we want to make sure we're, we're examining a cervical spine. Uh, you're going to take that just through the uh, you know the standard planes of motion uh, and make sure that's clear. In terms of just looking at uh, at your athlete, you know, we look at them from the front, we look at them from the side, we look at them from the back. We're interested in his posture. We're interested in his, uh, in his shoulder position overall, his scapular position. Is he retracted? Is he protracted? Uh, is he kyphotic? Is he lordotic? These are all things I think that we need to start to pay attention to uh, immediately. The other thing with just inspection, um, um, as Chris pointed out, uh, we're going to look at the acromacavicular joints. We're going to look at the S SC joints. We're looking for atrophy. We can pick all this up very, very quickly once you've ex examined hundreds or thousands of players. Um, it, it just almost becomes routine as you just sort of scan around and you're looking for all these things um, and, and that's a good start. And then once you've had just a, a general cursory look at everything, then I think you focus in on the, uh, the specific physical exam findings if you suspect an AC joint or a slap or a cuff or instability or a lat or a subscap or all the other multitude of things um, uh, that we see all the time. So, so let me have, have Tom. Tom, why don't you jump in there and say, let's just start with inspection. What are you looking at? Uh, just point out some of the structures that you're actually looking at on sure, Tony. So I, your uh, athlete. I usually start from the back. So the turn, let's turn around so we can all see the back then. Yeah. So, yep. So I usually start from the back, um, and one thing I'll, I'll uh, check for is atrophy, because uh, not uncommonly in these uh, baseball players, they'll get atrophy of the uh, infraspinatus. Uh, so, so where is that exactly uh, when you're looking right in here? So how do you how do you define that? Uh, like how do you how do you? Yeah, I mean, how do you know it's atrophy? Well, I mean, you, you have a, a normal side to compare to. Okay. Yeah. So you, you you look at both sides. You know, scapular spines right here. So supraspinatus fossa is going to be in here. Infraspinatus fossa in here, and you're going to compare the sides. Um, and, and you'll, like I said, probably, I don't know what you guys think. I, I've seen it quite a bit, 5%, 10% of the time in pitchers. Interestingly enough, even though we spend so much time working on external rotation, these guys uh, surprisingly seem to do really well. But nonetheless, I think very important thing to look at. Uh, like Mark talked about, I'll also assess the scapula. So you want to look at its uh, static 
uh, positioning, so which is still like this. And again, you always have the uh, normal side to compare to. Uh, next thing I'll do is have them. Uh, so go ahead and rate. raise up your arms and just kind of what are the things you're looking at with a. So now you're now it's more of a dynamic evaluation of the scap here. They want to see if it's uh, moving uh, symmetrically side to side. Uh, you want to look for winging on the on the way down. Again, and most of our difference. players, it's a very subtle thing. It's right yes. at the very when they're putting the arms out at the very end, and sometimes you have to move it two or three times to really to get it to come out. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So in that situation, you call that more of a dyskinesia than a true scapular winging. It's a it's they're doing something to compensate for something else, or how do you interpret that? Yeah, I think I think like you point out. I mean, I think you can have true winging where the, the scapula really is uh, sticking out quite a bit, and then oftentimes. It's not a winging, but things just are not moving uh, symmetrically, and that would be more of a, a dyskinesia or you know, uh, asynchrony. And so that's really helpful because that's something we typically don't operate on, but we have rehab protocols that can be helpful, and that might improve the way the shoulder is playing. So then what do you do from the front side then or the side? What, what other structures yeah, are you so looking I, for? I, I start there, then I'll, I'll typically uh, move to the front. Um, typically, at that point, uh, palpate uh, various structures. So... Uh, coracoid process, uh, long head bicep uh, tendon, you know, SC joint, AC joint. Like Mark said, a lot of this is uh, predicated based on their history and presentation. I mean, if they've got pain here, I don't know that you need to spend a whole lot of time on their uh, SC joint, but basically run through the different uh, anatomical uh, structures. And then I typically at that point will move on to testing uh, strength. Uh, and so I'll test um, external rotation, uh, elevation, um, and I'll, external rotation, I'll, I'll, I'll check a variety of ways. I'll, I'll check it kind of at the side, and then sometimes I'll also check uh, with them up kind of in the uh, throwing position, and you're looking for, again, differences uh, side to side. So when you're, when you're doing range of motion, we see in a lot of the published papers these measurements with goniometers. Do you do that in every one of your athletes? Do you lay them down, keep the scapula flat, and measure exactly so that you know if it's three degrees difference that that could be at risk for injury, like, we, the, we, like the scientific papers suggest? Right. No, we, we uh, in spring training, oftentimes, Will, I think you make a great point, Tony, in that when you want to look at glenohumeral motion, you need to do it, in, in my opinion, laying down. Uh, even if you've treated like frozen shoulder in the clinic, you'll get fooled if you just examine them um, sitting or standing because they can compensate with uh, scapular thoracic motion. And so we will lay them down, that pins down the scapula on the bed, and then you can get a true assessment of uh, glenohumeral motion. Um, and as we've talked about already, I mean, you, you want to compare to side to side. We've done a, a lot of... Uh, work in the lab, or well, not really in the lab. So, so Tom, for the yeah. purposes of this, because we're doing the exam, we're gonna come yeah. up to this stuff, why don't we go over our labral exam? The most common reason that there is shoulder surgery based on the Major League Baseball hits data is for a labral problem. And the most common procedure that's done is a debridement, not a repair. Right. But that's based on the data that's available. So what do you do to assess the labrum? Yeah, let me, I just want to just real quick on the, on the range of motion though. Um, we, we've looked a lot at uh, humeral torsion, and that can really impact range of motion. I know we don't all have those measurements available, but that's something really to think about. And then I also would, would suggest to you that you sequentially follow range of motion, because people can have kind of chronic loss of internal rotation that may mean nothing. So just uh, follow that. So now you said Tony uh, Labram? Yeah, so uh, that's the most no, no, common. I was going to hold your mic so you could yeah. do an exam. Yeah. Um, I, I think. Uh, Thanks, Mark. You know, if you've looked at the literature, obviously for like slap tears, there's like 40 tests or something like that, and none of them are any good. So, um, I think a lot is history. I, I still do tend to uh, use the active compression uh, test for uh, slap tears. Oh, yeah, so uh, you bring the arm uh, in uh, elevation here. You want to come a little bit of adduction, and then you want to turn the thumb down and then you're gonna have the athlete resist you. So I'm pushing down, he's pushing up. And then what you wanna ask him is, you know, does this cause pain? If it causes like right hip pain, then obviously it's not very significant. Um, that test does, uh, will cause pain in somebody that has AC pain. And so you wanna try and distinguish between deep anterior shoulder pain, which would be, you know, slap tear uh, versus uh, AC pain. Um, AC pain obviously in these athletes less Common. I mean, obviously, if they ran into the wall like Chris's guy or had uh, arthritis, which, again, less common in these young athletes, but that's a, a distinguishing point. 
And then the other uh, one I'll often use, I don't even know if this has a name, I saw Jim Anders do it, but I'll put the patient supine, so pretend he's laying down, and then bring him into uh, forward elevation, and then internally rotate the shoulder. And I, I, I spent some time with uh, Jim Anders, and he used that as, I call it an Anders slap test, I don't know if you guys ever use that. Yeah, with them, yeah, then with the, like forced internal rotation, yeah, yeah. So, Mark, what do you, what do you do for your slap and labral pathology, and how do you can you tell from your exam if it's going posterior on you, like some of these uh, throwers get? Yeah, I, th I think um, I think you can a little bit. Um, you know, typical slap pain is going to be deep down in the shoulder, and, and oftentimes it's uh, it can be in the back and also be in the front. Sometimes they have pathology in the front that hurts them in the back. You know, some of that's going to be driven again by, you know, by your history. At what phase of throwing motion are they feeling this? If it's late cocking uh, and it's mechanical every single time, it's typically going to be something in the back, back side of the shoulder. Uh, acceleration, follow through, um, symptoms are going to tend to be in the front. Um, for the guy that's got um, stuff going on in the back of his shoulder, it's more of a uh, cross-body adduction, internal rotation that's going to give them discomfort back here. You can also do a little posterior glide, a little load and shift out the back, and if that can reproduce symptoms in the back, then, then you may be dealing with something in the back side of the shoulder. The active compression test, or the O'Brien's test that, uh, that Tom described, um, as he said, is only about 60% specific. You know, we bring, a, bring it across, thumb down, push up, you know, ask him if it reproduces pain, yes. Hand up, so supinated up, less pain in that position. That's considered a positive test. That's not real specific for anterior or posterior. We can then bring them up into the abducted externally rotated position, okay? And typically done in a, in a supine setting, as, as Tom pointed out. This position, um, abduction external rotation, that reproduces deep anterior pain and is relieved with posterior pressure, okay? Not apprehension, but pain. Well, if it's apprehensive, it's probably an instability thing. If it's pain, it could be an anterior labrum, could be an anterior capsule, something along those lines, okay? So th this position for anterior. So. Here's posterior, here's anterior, and then just, you know, and then your just general stability exam is going to be, you know, your load and shift, looking for a sulcus, always comparing side to side. So um, in, mixed in, in all this stuff is also the biceps tendon. So how, how do you separate out the labrum biceps? Is there any particular exam findings that you use to try to determine whether it might be more biceps or labrum or both? I think it's... Uh, I, I, I think it's, uh, yeah, sorry. I think it's challenging. Um, I, I will go, you know, if they're tender over the bicep tendon, I think that's more specific to bicep than uh, labrum. I think speeds test is a, you know, reasonable test. And with that, you bring the arm in elevation, uh, supination, and then uh, have them push up against you. And that should reproduce anterior shoulder pain. Uh, obviously, we're talking about young athletes here. If, if you are examining middle-age athletes, uh, when I do speeds tests, I'm careful to push right here because I know Hawk had, I think, a couple of patients he ruptured their bicep. One of my partners had uh, another patient he ruptured his distal bicep. So unless you want to create some more surgical cases. That was a lot of force on the arm yeah. for exam. <laughs> so so, so the, the, that's one of the challenges we have. So both of them are giving you a lot of sort of uh, qualifiers on the exam because, as we know, and one of the reasons we want to have this session is that our examinations are, are not as specific as we would like them to be, and there can be a lot of overlap. So the active compression test, when Dr. O'Brien initially described that, was to try to tell the difference between superior labrum and AC joint. And then later on, it became an issue with regards to understanding where the biceps was involved. And as patients get older, so the older athlete, like in their 30s and 40s, then the rotator cuff can mask all of these symptoms. And so that's why it gets really difficult. So Mark said to be careful and understand the history of where it's at. And Tom's going over a bunch of different exams. Steve O'Brien talks about the three pack, so biceps palpation, active compression, and then the throwing mechanism, all related to anterior shoulder, as a way that he tries to define it's a biceps tendon. Do either of you use that uh, as a way to try to define that? That's all part of the test you've been yeah, doing. I, you know, I use all of that. I don't, yeah. I don't think it's 98% specific like sure. Steve does. Um, he's yeah. better at that. He has, you know, he obviously has incredible uh, understanding of that. Uh, but what Tony's talking about is. Um, uh, palpation of the biceps tendon, which, you know, if you sit with the arm in neutral position, you come about a centimeter over and about a centimeter or so down, and his biceps tendon is sitting basically right in this area. I find... Don't look at the ring. Yeah. Don't look at the ring. I find, <laughs> I find um, 
Anterior shoulder pain is really difficult in these guys. For me, it's, it's the most difficult diagnostic challenge that we have. Think about everything that's going on in the front of this guy's shoulder, right? It's anterior supraspinatus, top of his subscap, his rotator interval, his, his biceps pulley system, his biceps. I mean, there's tons of stuff going on in there. You can't find it all on your physical exam. Your physical exam is going to help you sort of get into the direction um, uh, that you think it's going. Um, uh, and Dr. O'Brien talks about getting up in this. If, if this, he called this, it's like the throwing motion. Uh, does he apply pressure? Yeah, he, he basically goes like they're going to go throwing, and as soon as they go to initiate it, that's, and they feel it at the same spot. Yeah, they feel it in the same spot. So pain here, tender here, reproduced here. Steve thinks it's, it's probably bicep. He's probably right. So in our last few minutes, rotator cuff. Many of these athletes have partial thickness rotator cuff tears. So we have to try to figure out on our exam, is that just a normal uh, adaptation of the shoulder over time? They've gradually peeled off the inner surface and that's not really their issue? Or this is really part of their uh, symptoms of pain? So how, how do you, Tom, look for, this is a rotator cuff problem and I need to be worried about that as a real issue. How do you tell? I think for me, probably strength testing and then also seeing if that simulates uh, pain. Uh, now, what I would tell you, I mean, I think it is important these guys also to kind of uh, serially like, exam them. I don't mean like every five minutes, but over the course of a few days. Because a lot of times when these guys are acutely painful, every test you do hurts. And so, so you do need to kind of follow them with time and see what sorts out. But for me, you know, again, any, any sort of weakness with, with rotator cuff strength testing uh, accompanied with pain, it tends to point me towards uh, cuff. Yeah, the, the, the players are often, when you ask them, does that hurt, they say, you mean, does it hurt like it usually does after I throw, or it's a different kind of hurt? So it's, uh, it's, it's, we always have to qualify it for this. So, Mark, what do you do to say, this is probably a rotator cuff problem I need to be worried about? Yeah, and, and again, I think part of that goes back to history. Where is it hurting me and when, um, you know, for sure. Um, you know, cuff pain typically in these athletes is going to be just like it is in, uh, in your other athletes. It's going to be tends to be laterally based, maybe off that anterior corner, may radiate down to the deltoid insertion. Um, well, like Tom, uh, for me, it's, it's, it's weakness in combination with reproduction of symptoms. So if, you know, if, if resisted, here, let me just stand here. So if resisted external rotation, stand uh, facing me. So if it's the left side, so this is infra, right? And usually um, um, a thrower's cuff pathology is at the junction of the posterior supra and the anterior portion of the infraspinatus. Right? That's usually where we see it. So we need to examine both of those. So resist external rotation here, okay? That's pure, it's almost pure infra here as we come up into abduction in the scapular plane, thumb down, push up. That's gonna be more supra. Back here, backwards here. That's posterior, getting way around the back, posterior infra teres back in that area. Subscap, while we're on it, elbow straight, wrist straight, push down into your belly, okay? Belly press. The other thing we like for uh, for subscaps uh, is up here, down forward. That reproduces pain in your athletes with your with your subscaps, and and then of course lat. You know we know that one. Go ahead and push down on me here, and, and that's going to be lat there. So, um, you know, difficult sometimes to. Most of these things come in combinations. Your guys that have your undersurface cuff tears oftentimes also have something going on. You know, in their labrum, uh, oftentimes that. You don't figure it out until you're in surgery what it is you're going to do with that. You know, you may see a, a slap lesion, an undersurface cuff tear uh, on the MRI. They may tell you that that's what's hurting them. You may find that on physical examination. You get in, you look at their shoulder arthroscopically. Their labral tear is just an adaptive peel back, you know, and you're probably not going to fix that, but their cuff is just shredded, uh, you know, and those are the ones you debride. And, and, uh, you know, we could have a whole weekend course just we, about We really could. So we wanted to at least give you a, a little bit of an idea of the things that we're all thinking about. And I, a couple of really key points. Number one, inspection is important. Uh, you can pick up a lot of information, especially with the scapula. Number two, in terms of palpation, know your surface anatomy and extend out beyond the shoulder. Number three, in terms of our motion analysis, we can do very specific motion analysis, particularly if we're trying to be accurate and share that information with other people. Many of us don't do a goniometer every time, but if we're really trying to share uh, uh, scientific evidence, we really should do something that accurately measures that. In terms of strength, we really want to measure the cuff as if we're thinking about each part of the
the rotator cuff, as Dr. Schickendeds to explain to you. And the labrum's the same way. What's the superior labrum, what's anterior, what's posterior? And then, of course, we kind of know what happens in most of our baseball players, so we focus on those things. I think Tom made a very important point, and that is don't sell yourself on the very, very first examination that you do. Do that exam, assess the athlete, and then come back and find out again which is really bothering, what's the thing that's really different than it has before, and I think that'll give you the best clues. Yes, we use the MRI as a very valuable tool, but as we'll hear throughout the rest of the day, there's a lot of findings on MRI that do not correlate to the clinical findings, and if the findings on MRI are questionable, we come back to the exam for why we're gonna treat these patients, so that's why it's so important. So thank you very much for sharing those pearls with us, we appreciate it, and thanks for being our model today. It was great, thank you.